and a warm welcome to everyone who's uh, with us today. Uh, this is the second of a series of conversations with authors hosted by Champaka Bookstore Library and Cafe. I am Tejasvi, uh, curator at Champaka, and uh, our author in conversation today is Manu, Manu S. Pillai. Um, Manu is the author of uh, three popular and uh, acclaimed books of history, his debut, The Ivory Throne, uh, like a sweeping look at 300 years of intrigue in the Travancore court, won the Sahitya Academy, Yuva Paraskar in 2017, uh, Rebel Sultans, uh, published in 2018, sweeps through 500 years of Deccan history from the close of the 13th century to the dawn of the 18th century. And his most recent book is The Courtesan, The Mahatma and the Italian Brahmin, a collection of short pieces which was published in 2019. Welcome, Manu. Welcome. Thank you for having me and thank you for doing this online. It's good to see books in the background at your place also, considering oh. that we can't do this in the actual bookstore. Yeah, that's true. It's quite, well, what do you do? Such are the times. <laughs> you know, uh, this reminds me, talking of the times, you know, a couple of weeks back, uh, after a particularly long day of work online, I picked up your uh, courtesan and uh, the book and uh, open and the book automatically opened to the story of uh, uh, Tuluka Nacha, the Muslim princess in a Hindu temple. I must have read this book, uh, I mean, this particular story several times. It's quite a fascinating one. And yet I read it again and it felt fresh and exciting. You know, it allowed for a certain space and time travel that in the current lockdown conditions, I'm, you know, privileged to have, like, unlike many people in this country. What makes these uh, stories special to you? You know, I think the first thing is that these are unusual stories. It's not that they don't exist. It is merely that we don't hear enough of these stories as we should. So, you know, always once you, once you pick up this, this rather annoying habit of digging out unusual <laughs> stories, you then have an antenna that gets alerted every time there's even a hint of something that is not mainstream, something that is not, uh, you know, typical, something that's not the same hackneyed story of a king or a queen, or, or, or even if it is, it at least has to be someone interesting in some way, as opposed to, you know, again, one of those cliched uh, characters of history. We are always uh, regularly fed. So I think the Toluko Nachar story for me was specifically interesting because, you know, the whole idea that there's a Muslim woman, in one case, she's actually veiled. She exists in two temples, not one. Yeah, uh, one is Sri Rangab, the other is Male Kote. Male and Kote. one of them is a wall painting, and the other, she's an actual idol with, a, with her face covered because she's a veil. And, uh, you know, she's wearing a veil. And to me, that was so fascinating to read. The idea that, you know, in an Hindu, Orthodox Hindu temple controlled by Brahmins, where non-Hindus technically can't enter, you've right. got an image, you've got a deity of sorts, who's actually of Muslim origin. And that, that reminds me of, you know, so much of people often talk about the, the syncretic nature of religion in our country. And I think this is, this is one of the marks of that, where uh, there was an accommodation possible and custom and ritual and even the idea of uh, an existing deity could sort of amend itself and sort of become flexible in order to adjust and make room, make space for a completely foreign entity, for an entity that they didn't envision would exist in their universe. But once that uh, Islamic power and Islamic ideas came into, into Indian society, they found their own ways to balance that, that equation out. And in this particular case, the story is, of course, of this, you know, usually the story is what? Like you have a Padmavati. It's yeah. usually the story of a Muslim Sultan lusting for a right, right. Princess, going out to capture her and destroying forts and killing thousands of people in the process. That's right. This, you know, these are called, uh, scholars have called the songs of, or ep epics of conquest. The Tuluka Nachar story is what you call an epic of resistance, which is where the apparent victim sort of turns the same formula around and says, well, I'm going to use the same metaphors, the same idea to my advantage. Right. So in this case, it's not a Muslim king lusting after Hindu women. It is a, a, a Hindu deity who comes to terms with a Muslim princess who's fallen in love with the deity. Right. And, you know, this is the daughter of the Sultan of Delhi, a completely yeah. abstract uh, concept. There's no yeah. name. There's no name. Yeah. It's just this abstract concept of a Where Sultan of Delhi. Yeah, who came? Whose daughter fell in love. No idea. Yeah. So similar, you know, that, that, that's interesting that you picked up a story of resistance because one of the other stories of resistance that a person of whom is held as a story of resistance today, the Shivaji, is also someone who you have tackled in the book and how 
that uh, that the unidimensional way in which he is portrayed today is not something that you need to see it in context and you need to see him as a person of his times that his own um, uh oh dear something's happening on my that, screen <laughs> yeah something's happening on mine too well i see modi ji and indira gandhi side yes. by side that seems to fit sorry sorry <laughs> uh so um this is perhaps what you had we had spoken about earlier <laughs> anyway yeah. so uh, uh if you uh, think of shivaji story again that there is there are more layers to it and then you see him not just as a figure of resistance but also of survival and of uh, his own you know when his own uh, uh, life his own existence was threatened as a ruler we he had to deal with many other uh, sorry uh, excuse me someone there can you please switch off over is sorry uh, uh no go ahead though go ahead. so uh let's say So, so what kind of uh, so you said that these stories are important for you because they are not just unusual but you are also bringing in other perspectives into those stories that make them important and contemporary and uh, interesting today right no you know it's not you know you mentioned the british rajji as an example and one of the interesting things about him is again that we see him in extreme terms which is that you know either he is the savior of the hindus this warrior who was all about hindu swaraj hindavi swaraj resurrecting hindu pride or people say oh no he was the savior of peasants he was uh, you know somebody who worked for the subaltern the marginalized forgotten and he was not this champion of hinduism is a later yeah my whole issue is that this kind of extreme uh, thing on either side is problematic because because often the truth is somewhere in the middle which is that in the case of a shivaji yes you know till uh, the 1670s there are still hopes that he'll become part of the mughal empire he'll find a way into the mughal court they actually take him to agra where he's they try to see if he can be sort of absorbed into the mughal court as the rajputs were and in fact if that experiment had succeeded history would have been perhaps very different yeah but as it happened that experiment failed and he decided he wanted to there was no going back to the mughals after that there was no you know turning the page back he had to start his own course after that so he decided he would consecrate himself through sanskritic rituals as a king and when he did that he came up with the idea of a hindavi swaraj he 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 gave up and con- consciously discarded persianate and islamicate ideas of state and picked up sanskritic ideas of state he com- he got court court poetry commission in which uh, you know these yavanas or these foreigners are, are lambasted and he is here to restore dharma and all of that so it is true that shivaji did have that but we're talking about kingly self image not a uh, communal idea this yeah. is a king exactly. crafting his newly forged kingly identity in sanskritic terms as opposed to islamic or persian terms was there a syncretic element yes there was also that and you know the most the, the highlight for this that i give often is the the sheer fact that shivaji's father and uncle were both named after muslim a muslim right. uh, so you know or he goes yeah, to his yeah. grandpa who was the right hand man of a muslim king uh, he couldn't have children for a while so they went to a sufi saint because right. on the ground all holy men were equally holy it could be a hindu holy man it could be a muslim holy man a holy man was simply holy right. so there was that syncretic quality so the grandparents go there the sufi blesses them and that's how they have two sons and they name the older one shah ji the younger one sharif ji because the name of the sufi was shah sharif uh-huh. so you know shivaji talks about hindavi swaraj and dharma and all that but his own father and uncle are named after a muslim saint so it's a mixture of both on the ground there is syncretic tradition there is a mix there is an overlap but at kingly levels kings did have an identity which was often expressed in the vocabulary of religion our mistake is in pulling that out and making it communal thinking that they had these pan indian communal identities that didn't exist there's this wonderful new book by uh, shrinivas reddy on krishna devaraya uh, of vijayanagar one yeah and it's fascinating it's he's he's also drawn out a lot from literary sources and what's most remarkable is how he shows that vijayanagar had two enemies one was the sultans uh, to the north which was the adil shahi kingdom primarily yeah. the other was the king of orissa 
and no. Krishna Devaraya did not ally with the king of Orissa saying, oh, we are Hindus, let's destroy the Muslim king. Right, right. His chief enemy was actually the king of Orissa. And they had their own feuds because the Orissa king kept calling Krishna Devaraya Shudra because he apparently claimed a, a loftier Kshatriya title. Right, and right. this rankles Krishna Devaraya much more than his uh, you know, Muslim neighbor to the north. The Muslim neighbor is not his chief enemy. In many ways, his chief enemy is, uh, is the one in Orissa, the Hindu, the Gajapati. And what is also interesting is, you know, of course, the Muslim kings, when they conquered alien territory, if the alien territory did not submit, they used to destroy temples. That kind of iconoclasm and smashing of idols was normal at that time, especially during yeah, conquest. Hindu kings, however, could also steal idols. They may not destroy a temple. Yeah. They may actually pick up the idol and take it back. To take them. it back to another. Krishna Devaraya did that. He took up, he, he took an idol from Orissa and brought it to Hampi, to Vijayanagar. And he also did the same with the idol Pandarpur in Maharashtra, which was in the Sultan's territory. Yeah. The difference is the Sultan's idol, he eventually gave back. And that is why the idol still exists in like Pandarpur. The one he took from Orissa, he didn't give back. <laughs> he, he, for him, it was a mark of pride that he had got the, the Orissa Gajapati's deity. The Gajapati right. was supposed to protect that deity. He failed and Krishna Devara almost seems to have wanted to rub that in. Yeah. yeah. So in fact, uh, this brings me to a question. You know, so how do you see yourself as a chronicler of these stories? You obviously seem to be, you love to tell uh, interesting stories. Um, how do you say yourself as a historian? Because uh, often people, historians as a tribe, take themselves very seriously and write uh, tomes, you know, which are quite dense and hard to kind of, uh, um, uh, often hard to uh, understand, read and uh, steeped in their, uh, uh, in a particular language uh, um, of use, you know, which is very specific. But uh, to the subject now, what, how do you see yourself? What kind of historian are you? You know, in Western countries, there are these categories, right? You have a public historian, you have a popular historian, you've got academic historian. But one of the things that often happens in the West is that academics do write for larger audiences. So the most recent example I can give you is Supriya Gandhi, who, you know, teaches at Yale, I think, if I'm not wrong. And uh, she published a book on Dara Shugo, published by Harvard University Press, but it's written entirely in accessible language. Okay. It is not academic yeah. in its tone. It is a highly readable. And that sort of thing happens with Western academics or even Indian academics who teach in Western countries. I work with Sunil Khilmani, for example. He's a, he's a, you know, he's a senior academic, but even he's written these so-called popular books because it's okay there to do that. It's important even to do that. In India, what we find is that academics somehow have not quite bridged uh, that gap. They, they've sort of remained uh, in the seminar circuit instead yeah. of actually reaching out to a larger audience. So there is a new crop that's, uh, that's coming up. In some quarters, it's received with some hostility, which is that, oh, no, no, you know, this is, uh, you can't, you're not supposed to entertain through history. You're not supposed to, history is not about storytelling. You know, it's about those hard investigations and you, you know, keep it within that circle where everybody's a scholar who's reading it. But I think that's also changing. And then, you know, I, I'm getting this out of personal experience. When my first book came out, when it won that Sahitya Academy, Yuva Puraskar, the panel that gave it the award included serious senior scholars. Right. The second book, Rebel Sultans, was actually reviewed in an academic peer-reviewed journal by University of Illinois professor. Uh, you know, if you read uh, Ira Mukoti's new book on Akbar, it's yeah. been reviewed by Rudra Akshu Mukherjee, Harbans Mukherjee has praised it. You know, these are serious scholars in India who themselves don't write for, for mainstream audiences, but they are willing and actually happy to see that other people are doing uh, that job without dumbing down history. I think for me, my position is very much, you know, in the middle there, which is that with my PhD and all that, I have one foot in the academic uh, universe. But in terms of my writing, which sort of uh, preceded any uh, of my historical work, it was always writing that I was first a writer, even when I was much younger. So for me, that writing is always about storytelling. What I've done is merely married that interest in writing to my interest in history. Right. And I think that is a marriage I intend to keep and sustain for as long as possible. In fact, this brings me to another facet of being a historian. So you, uh, uh, a historian is someone who, uh, I mean, there's a view that his, a historian is someone who, who is shaped by, uh, by the times that he lives in, by the pol philosophies that he has uh, been exposed to, that he, uh, that he subscribes to. And that kind of seeps into his writing. 
so how do you see uh, like say for example someone is known as a marxist historian or a subaltern historian or you know something specific like that they get uh, their writing is also kind of related to that the, the, the latest cuss word is apparently secular historian but ah, anyway, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so where do you how do you see yourself as a historian of the times and uh, of what kind of historian you see yourself in that way you know it's it's perfectly natural for historians to have their own biases and their own uh, let's say imbalances when they look at something partly because historians are also human beings That's at the end of this where does bias come from it comes yeah. from human human limitation That's it comes from the fact that we are cultured and trained and we have these filters on our eyes and we can consciously knowingly you know we can get woke in that sense and peel back a lot of the layers yeah. we can consciously and make an ob- objective effort to try and understand things without letting our prejudices affect it but there's always a limit to that which is that you know no matter how much you try you are the creature of your times you are somebody who's been conditioned by your privilege by your gender by so many other factors you know uh, it's something as basic as that a male historian may approach something a certain way and not even see something that a female historian will see That's right. because her appearances may alert her to something that the male historian will, will sort of okay. glaze over because yeah. for him it's not even a factor yeah. so you know there are all these biases and i think historians or anybody working with history must acknowledge this because one of the reasons uh, we often see that especially today uh, there's a lot of disinformation and there's a lot of twisting of history is because we of you know we we take these categorical stances that this is the truth and that is you know all lies and and that's rubbish yeah, yeah. i don't think I don't think our job is to say this is the truth because there is no the the truth. You know, it's something that's constantly shifting and evolving and changing. Now, you know, that and often, you know, it, it often supports what the previous conclusions existed in the field. When people talk about ancient Indian history and Harappa, genetics is actually supporting a lot of the earlier theories. It's also changed a lot, but it's also supporting a lot of uh, earlier speculations. Earlier, it was in the realm of speculations, but now it's actually moving into greater certainty. Uh, similarly you know different times different uh, perspectives come into play which did not exist so for instance you know i often give the example of how the generation of jadunath sarkar gs sardesai all of those historians they never knew there was such a thing as a feminist perspective but right. today you can't ignore a feminist you can't ignore yeah exactly now our eyes have been open to the importance of bringing that perspective on board so i think you know these things constantly change we will also be judged perhaps not in 100 years from now perhaps even in in as uh, short a time as 20 years because the world spins much faster now yeah. because of the information excess of the age of information so we the kind of work we are doing may be criticized for lacking in in wisdom lacking in perspective etc uh, you know very shortly from now and that's just how it is i don't think you know we need to get over pious about it history is always about learning you're always you may write about history but you're also always a student of history so but this again leads me to another point that history is also like like a palimpsest you use that word in your book uh, that you have uh, history is rewritten over periods of time that you know according to the prevailing uh, philosophy is the prevailing uh, understandings uh, and the nature of evidence even for example the cultural moorings of what you think is history all that kind yeah. of inform like say for example the current clash that we are seeing in this country is in a way a clash between an academic understanding of history that comes from the west over the last 100 150 years of our understanding of history versus a itihasa informed yeah. kind of understanding of what history means culturally here yes so yes. Uh, if you look at that um history is also there for our understanding of history is also layered and rewritten and written uh, how in fact that's why you know the the argument uh, you know people often say how can you look at mythology as history yeah. you know you're not looking as at mythology as a statement or a catalog of facts yeah. but why those stories were told at that time in that way why a character behaved a certain way or why in this version of the epic a character is this way why in a later version such a character slightly uh, you know different and new uh, personalities and new sort of angles have come into play you have to interrogate those mythologies because they do have history in them so the the mytho- so when if you're talking at the rama and you're not actually dis- you know confirming or rejecting whether rama and uh, ravana actually had a battle 
right. what a historian is interested in is why was it composed in the first place right. what was it about the ramayana that not only made it popular from the gangetic belt all the way to the end to the tip of the peninsula and even in southeast south asia Africa. what was it about these these epics that suddenly bridged so much of cultural divide bridged so many languages bridged so many identities because anywhere you go there is a reference or there is a link that the epics have constructed and forged whether it's a tribal community somewhere whether it's a hill top somewhere there are these sacred geographies that have been created where anywhere you go in the country someone will say oh jatayu's wing fell yeah, there or sita came and sat or sita's jewelry fell here yes. you know there are these stories that come that is of historical interest whether jatayu and sita actually ravana and sita yeah. actually flew in a in a in a in some prototype of the aeroplane is not historical <laughs> yeah. that is not what interests yeah, us that's what right. interests us what is the epic achieving what is this mythology trying to communicate and what did it mean across so many uh, 2 3000 years for so many kinds of people at so many different times why is it that we've seen so much change in our society you know we are not the indian society that was there in the first century or, or in ashoka's time we are not the indian society that was uh, that was there when the you know first invasions took place in sindh we are not the indian society of the victorian era either we yeah. are in a new phase and yet the epic has retained its value and its appeal through all these changing social mores mm-hmm. why is that that has historical value that is why uh, you know the itihasa side of it also uh, comes into play and we can't simply reject everything because it doesn't give you oh this fa- happened in this year and this happened in this year and the years have to be exactly proper. exactly cultural memory is a source of history yeah actually that reminds me when you mentioned dates and uh, events it kind of takes me back to school and that seems to be the primary way in which the history is taught and learned you know there are these dates and these events and this is what happened at this point in time and this raja ruled and you know what you know you know yeah. that what, what was your uh, experience of learning history in school did you like it and then maybe we can talk i liked it no, history used to be this this mark losing subject for most of my classmates they used to end up with hideous marks and right. do extremely well at maths instead i used to suck at maths but i used to do very well in my history lessons because i actually enjoyed studying it even though the textbooks were less than ideal even though the textbooks had uh, very many flaws and limitations i still enjoyed the idea of the past you know my <laughs> i had my own uh, version of age of empires where i actually didn't have age <laughs> of empires the game but i used to create my own map on on paint brush and very quietly the whole game would be in my head where borders would be drawn and things would collapse and the empire would grow and things like that because i was interested in that world you know it was such a far removed thing it was such a fascinating uh, idea that i wanted to really uh, engage with that so i think uh, that's where it all it, uh, it came from and i had no issues uh, you know exciting myself with history well, even in school even if the textbooks it. were rough. kind of boring and it's so horrible horrible, horrible. But, but you yeah again linking it to the itihas a question we live in india yeah. there's so much storytelling around us no matter yeah. where you turn and these stories are always rooted to something or the other that is linked uh, to history so you can't really ignore history because the stories are always around us we're sort of uh, you know uh, swimming in an ocean of stories but it's just that most people don't wake up and notice that this is the case yeah. so you the textbooks also in a way are telling a story right as in the state wants to tell a story to to its citizenry and it kind wants to school you into a story like so for example if you take uh, the story of uh, the freedom movement in india uh, it's in history school history taught in india uh, indian history stops at 1947 in fact if you look at pakistan history begins almost at 1947 a lot of details beyond before that in school history gets kind of glossed over or interpreted in a different way whereas in indian school history it looks very you know it sounds very different so now you have that storytelling also happening right and now how do you think i mean of course which is why today uh, states the, it's such a contested area history is such a contested area and um, anything you write about uh, in history is always quite dicey how have yeah, you been mean, it's not surprising that states have their official versions and official narratives of history because yeah. that's always been the case that that's you know right. anywhere where there's power history is wedded at the hip to power because people <laughs> in power need history to need history. legitimize their their claim to power which yeah, means that exactly. whether it's an indian king whether it's the king of portugal yeah. whether it's the pope everybody every pulls out history yeah. to justify where they are and you know why they are there yeah. so that in itself does not does not surprise me uh what is funny though is when people get very agitated 
about certain things. For example, you know, there's Twitterati who will say, oh, look at these British uh, schools and the British system. They don't teach anything about colonial history. For them, the empire was this positive thing, spreading railways and spreading democracy, democracy around the world. <laughs> they, it's a benign, wonderful, civilizing force. That is the thing school kids in Britain learn. And that, that's yeah. actually true. That's what they learn. They never learn about the violence. They never yeah. learn about yeah. the pity. They don't learn about the... Indians who died in the famines and in the... None of that. Yeah. They don't learn any of that. But equally, while we're pointing fingers at them, we, we must realize we've also got three finger, fingers pointing at us. Because we learn about the greatness of our ancestors and these wonderful empires, etc. But we, we don't learn enough or we don't learn how much we oppressed our own through the caste system. You know, we cover the caste system as oh, these four castes existed and blah, 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 and then you move on. But we don't actually understand how privilege works. We say that they came here and oppressed us and they must study it. And we ourselves don't reflect on the way we've oppressed our own. And this is something, you know, if you're, if you're using one yardstick, it applies to everybody equally. And I think uh, politicians are never really the people to turn to to give you accurate history, which is why school history is always limited. School history is never really the, way, the place where you're going to get a, a good sense or an accurate idea of what the past may have looked like. That always usually comes at university level. It always usually comes in higher studies. Yeah. And it only comes to those who actually want to study it. Yeah. And in fact, it, it should also at this point come from more popular sources as well, like books that you are writing. Um, no, it should also come from popular sources in the sense that, you know, this is another point I often make, which is that people have this preoccupation with records, saying, where are the records? The records yeah. must be seen for true history. That something is that, that positivist method is criticized because not everything is written down. Not everything is, is, yeah. is sort of codified and put into inscriptions or, or, uh, or, or documents or paper or farm. A lot of it is oral especially in an unequal society, as you go further down the caste order, you find that a lot of it is in song, in lore, in folk yeah, traditions. Exactly. A lot of the gods of, of, of you know, the larger Hindu system are now dead because those gods are no longer worshipped. Those gods have been completely removed and mainstream gods have sort of become the chief uh, you know, appetite for most people. Uh, there, are, there are so many stories, historical figures who've fallen out of the historical record because they were never written down about it. So this obsession with written records is political in its own way because it prioritizes and privileges a certain kind of uh, history as opposed to another kind, which was oral. And this was an oral is not merely, you know, although I gave the example of lower caste groups, it's not merely lower caste groups. For the yeah. longest time in, in Rajputana, for example, it was the bards who kept genealogies. It was the they right. who sang about the glories of kings, etc. In the 19th century, this was codified, which is why we have yeah. it. The fact of the matter is that it was a very oral tradition even till the 19th century. Yeah. So, you know, we have to be there are still family, by the sources way, that way also. There are still family historians in North Karnataka, for example, and maybe other parts of the country who do this, who carry entire yeah. family histories. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we are kind of running out of time. <laughs> we have a short, uh, uh, you know, Zoom is kind of telling, reminding me, you know, there are seven minutes. I'm sorry. So we'll we'll open it up to questions right now. So thank you, Manu, for this uh, lovely conversation. Thank you. And uh, audience, please uh, type in your questions. We'll there are eight one. things in the chat box, so you can choose the question I'll answer. Because otherwise, I'll get confused. Uh, go ahead. Uh, what was the most surprising historical anecdote you came across? Well, you know, there's. <laughs> I wouldn't say, see, the thing is, the more you study history, nothing really surprises you because frankly, there are so many strange and bewildering stories all over the place that surprises are, uh, and surprises lose their, their novelty value. But I think in my, in my, in my third book, I talk about Kuredat Tatri, the yeah, Nambudri, right. my favorite uh, who in 19, yeah, was discovered uh, in an adulterous relationship and she was not supposed to. Nambudri women were heavily policed and uh, kept uh, under, you know, under veil. Whereas she managed to have an affair with 66 people and there are actual records of this even now sitting in the Atnagulam archives. And for me, that was absolutely fascinating yeah. to think that in 1905, there was a scandal like this yeah. of its time that was covered in the press featuring yeah. a Brahmin woman and 66 right. men across caste, right. including celebrities, including Mahouts, including all kinds of people. I think that was a, it was an eye opener about MJR's you know, father. Yeah, you read in the official books yeah. about, oh, Brahmin community, they were vegetarians, they did these pujas, right. la la la. And then you realize, hold on, there was this woman who flouted and turned that whole system right. on its head and did something so scandalous. Yeah, okay. 
this is other question do you think that the disproportionately high emphasis on teaching requirements plus lack of a significant support system around teaching like graduate teaching assistants as in prevalent in the west is in educational settings leave little time for actual research within the indian academic community yeah yeah indian indian system is i mean terribly bad on research i mean private universities are trying to change this a lot of of course top level public universities also do it they they're famous for that but in general research skills are not something we are taught we are also not taught critical analysis we are not taught to interrogate received wisdom we are given received wisdom we we learn it by rote and then we put it onto a sheet of paper for our exams we are not actually taught to think any research emerges from that from using your brain to actually think and analyze and rationally and critically approach a subject and yeah. we are I, i suspect very backward when it comes to that so a next question is uh, what makes writing uh, books of history different from a typically factual book written by contemporary authors today which merely consists of dates and historical events presented in a chronological order <laughs> No, no. I also have chronological order to what I write. <laughs> It's just that you know, if you have if you have an interest and the capacity to also write as a writer and and make things, uh, you know, give it a flow that is interesting, bring in your voice and a tone that that can sort of appeal to people. That's what I think makes all the difference. The same facts can be presented yeah. as a catalog, or it can be presented as in a, in a narrative that can appeal and you know interest people. That's it. um is there peer review or can it be instituted for historical treatises will that take away some of the human element from historical accounts i mean in the current system as it exists yeah we people exist expect that you know they they i mean i've seen this right any kind of academic writing you write there's supposed to be nothing literary about it it's supposed to be very uh, to the point because the readership is limited yeah. which is precisely why if it's for a general reader they can't be a peer reviewed system and uh, you know general publishers don't do it it's academic publishers who do it who have a peer review fact checking system. can be done at least right fact checking is important i think yeah so there is another question how ah so this relate this kind of answers how do you verify the authenticity of information you've talked about that um do you have any ideas for reform of history education how how can we better teach children and young adults to embrace nuance i think you know these again i'm not very hopeful when it comes to textbooks because textbooks have very many limitations too many uh, but i think the teacher can make all the difference if a teacher is actually interested in history the teacher can make the subject come alive and you know that i think could uh, possibly make a difference other than that i don't think i mean the other thing is of course is exposing children to not just textbooks when it comes to history but to places but to people yeah. you know take them out of the Peter. classroom history is not something that needs to be in a classroom in a book alone you know it's ironic that i'm saying it but that's the fact if india is one of those countries where you can't walk 2 miles without running into something Actually, historical yeah you don't need history and if you're living in a, in a in a in a small town like you know nasik you don't really yeah. need to go and look at the red fort you yeah. can actually trace history through the local landmarks yeah. through the local sort of uh, historical uh, geography as it were or yeah. sacred geography even and that's how you can bring history alive i think possible so i think i'll kind of uh, have one or two more questions and then we'll sure. uh, wrap up and then i have a last question for you uh, sure. uh, so the um, say okay so many can you explain your process of writing a history book from choosing topic research synthesis and forming a hypothesis etc topic usually falls into your lap while you're working on something else because you know often you're chasing one a uh, topic and in the process you discover something else and you sort of bank it and file it on the side thinking wait i need to come back to that and that's how you then land into your next topic uh the process is simple first for me at least it's first to gather all the material or as much material as possible then a minute i think and and using that material to create a skeletal draft and once the skeletal draft is done do another round of research and then more writing so that's usually how i work yeah so thank you manu that's all the time we have for questions today and can you just share with us quickly what you're reading now in this time of lockdown oh, i'm actually reading this book much maligned monsters by partha mitra it's actually a very old book it's about european responses to indian art and how they thought that indians worship monsters and devils <laughs> devil worship we we definitely do that <laughs> Thank you so much for this one this time. And thank you for having me. I just realized my thank screen is extremely dark which I should have lit better. No that's uh, all right. You're fine. All right. Thanks everyone thank for you. joining. Thank you for joining Thanks. us and uh, see you again soon. Thank you.